Hi, my name is Bob Solomon. I teach at the University of Texas in the wonderful city of Austin. This is going to be a lecture, or a series of lectures, on a very exciting and still vital philosophy called existentialism. I call it no excuses because the idea is that one of the main themes is taking responsibility. Existentialism might be conceived of as a movement, not a sensibility, not a series of doctrines to be sure. One can think of it in many different ways, but in the literature that has come out in the years when existentialism first became popular just after the Second World War and ever since, it often has the connotation of being a particularly gloomy philosophy, one that's obsessed with the notions of anxiety and dread. So the first thing to say, perhaps, is that I find existentialism actually a very invigorating and positive-minded philosophy. And the no excuses idea, in part, says we do have control over our own lives. It's often thought that existentialism is an atheistic philosophy. And it's true that some rather notorious atheists were existentialists, most notably Jean-Paul Sartre, who gave the movement its name. But Soren Kierkegaard, whom I'll be talking about shortly, was also an existentialist. In fact, one might say the first existentialist. And he was devoutly religious. One might even say, in today's terms, that he would be counted as a Christian fundamentalist. And he's not the only one. Martin Buber, the Jewish existentialist, uh, some of the more recent um, Christian existentialists like Karl Barth. One finds the entire spectrum, and one can put the nature of God well within the Christian, uh, with, well within the existential tradition. One can trace the movement as far back as one likes. Um, I've often heard it traced back to Socrates, who, after all, said famously, one should know thyself, and took great responsibility for his own behavior, defended the virtues, and was very much the individual. I've heard it traced back to Heraclitus, before Socrates, a philosopher who defended the, the uh, impermeability imperme of life and who often delighted in contradictions and dark sayings. I would say St. Augustine was sort of a proto-existentialist because, again, his confessions are so inward-looking and he's so concerned with the questions of who I am and what I'm to do. But for our purposes here, I'm going to restrict our attention to five figures. I'm going to begin, out of sequence, with the philosopher Albert Camus, possibly because he's the easiest to understand, but also because I think he captures the sensibility that represents existentialist thinking and explains why so many students over the last 50 years have become enamored with the movement. Then I'll go back in chronology, and I'll pick up the first existentialist, as I said, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher who worked roughly in the middle of the 19th century. I'll talk about Friedrich Nietzsche, who, while he has some differences with Kierkegaard and with some of the later philosophers, nevertheless clearly fits into this sequence. I want to talk about Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher at the beginning of this century, although he didn't die until 1976, uh, someone who was actually very influential in terms of setting up the kind of philosophy, both existentialism and what is today called postmodernism, that still rules many universities today. And finally, Jean-Paul Sartre, who, as I said, gave the movement its name and is probably the single most famous existentialist and Typically, when people talk about existentialism, it's Sartre's ideas they have in mind. Nevertheless, it's not a school, and there are all sorts of differences. Just to start with the obvious, I mentioned that Kierkegaard is a devout Christian. Nietzsche is famously a rather, rather vitriolic atheist. So you're going to get, as I said, a whole spectrum of views coming from religion and so on. In the same way, if you consider politics, uh, existentialism is often considered a kind of left-wing conspiracy. 
But the truth is that while Sartre was a Marxist, Nietzsche was, if anything, a kind of reactionary, and Kierkegaard um, was completely apolitical. Martin Heidegger, by contrast, was a fascist. So when we talk about existentialism, I think it's very important not to try to pin it down too much to begin with, not to try and define it in terms of this or that doctrine or this or that set of beliefs, but rather I'd like you to keep your mind open and see what these various very individualistic figures have to say about themselves and about life and we'll come to some conclusions. The movement is defined probably best of all by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, Sartre died really just quite recently. He had a very long career in which he changed many of his ideas. But I think one of the things that he said in a very late interview captures very much what we're going to be talking about comes down to. He says, I have never ceased to believe that one is and one makes oneself of whatever is made of one. Now, language is a bit convoluted, as you'll see. Many of these figures tend to enjoy um, rather difficult language. But the idea of, as he put it in his earlier writings, we make ourselves, that there's a sense of self-creation here, is going to be very important throughout. I also want to expand the idea of existentialism to include not just philosophers, properly speaking, and of course, Nietzsche, Sartre, and Camus were also rather accomplished literary authors as well. But I'd like to include at least a couple novelists and poets. I'm thinking in particular of Dostoevsky and Kafka and a few others as well. There are three themes I'd like to talk about. The first is the emphasis on the individual. All of these characters were, I think we can say without insult, truly eccentric. Kierkegaard defined himself against the reigning passions and doctrines of the age. In particular, when Kierkegaard was philosophizing, much of Danish society, and certainly the whole idea of Christianity, was wrapped in the idea of a kind of collective consciousness, sometimes summarized as the Holy Spirit, or in the secular realm, <coughs> summarized by the term bourgeois. Kierkegaard, by contrast, defined himself as the individual. In fact, he said on his tombstone what he would like written is simply the individual. Nietzsche, of course, is another <clears throat> great eccentric. Nietzsche wrote pretty much in isolation. In fact, he lived in isolation for most of his mature life. He sometimes would reach out to an audience, but it's always very interesting that it's a very select audience. And in fact, he dedicates his books to the very few. In fact, one of the tricks that Nietzsche uses quite effectively, and I would say this is true of Kierkegaard as well, is he writes as if he's writing for you, the singular reader, alone. He really has a kind of mini conspiratorial tone that makes us think it's just us, we're different, and we're especially different from all of them. This notion of individuality takes different forms too. Camus, when he was in Algeria, where he was born and spent most of his life, found himself very much at odds with both the French population, of which of course he was a member, and also the Algerian population, who were fighting for independence. And he gained his reputation as a courageous individual, in part by taking a very independent stand, one which he continued when he moved to France and was in southern France during the occupation by the Nazis. Jean-Paul Sartre takes individuality in a different direction. Individuality basically comes down to the idea of individual choice, and it's the heart of Sartre's philosophy, that we are always making choices. We make them as individuals, it doesn't matter if the whole society or the whole world makes them at the same time, but the responsibility that he talks about is always the responsibility of the individual for making his or her choices and accepting the consequences that flow from it. The second theme is the importance of the passions. <clears throat> 
If you look back through the history of philosophy, one of the things that I find striking is the fact that the passions are very often the whipping horse. Philosophy is defined as reason or the love of reason. Wisdom is often considered to be a version of reason, being reasonable. Well, there has always been a kind of undercurrent of opposition here. I would mention Heraclitus again as someone who fully recognized the power of the passions. Of course, the Greek playwrights before him, the great tragedians, they were very keen on the power of the passions, which they sometimes demonized, but nevertheless were very clear that these are very important elements in human life. Moving up to our um, area here, you might note that Kierkegaard is going to define what it means to really exist that special notion of existence, which is going to give rise to the term existentialism. But to really exist is to be passionate. In particular, it's to passionately commit oneself to a way of life, and in Kierkegaard's case, to passionately commit oneself to Christianity. He talks about passionate inwardness. So we're not talking about passions here fully expressed and exploded on the stage so much as we're talking about passions that one might oneself feel but not show. And Kierkegaard makes a good deal out of talking about the truly passionate person isn't the one who is dramatically visible for everyone else. The truly passionate person is the one who is quite inwardly contained and defined by his or her passions. We often have the idea that the passions take us over. The idea that the passions happen to us. The idea from the ancient world that the passions are often intermittent bouts of insanity. But for the existentialist, it's very clear that to live is to live passionately. Nietzsche is well known as a very passionate philosopher. When you read his works, as I hope you do, it is filled with all sorts of excitement and enthusiasm, uh, to put it in a rather trivial way. He uses more exclamation points than probably any other philosopher in the history of the subject. He is always expounding and enthusing. He's always praising, condemning. But in his life itself, it's very clear that while he was a very quiet and courteous man, his philosophy and his life were defined by some really exciting, dramatic, grand passions. And he encourages us to live according to our passions. The third theme, possibly the most famous, and certainly for some of the philosophers, Kierkegaard and Sartre in particular, the most central, is the concept of freedom. Now what freedom means is something, of course, which has been highly debated. It's one of the ironies of history that virtually every regime in every country from the most authoritarian to the most anarchistic, has defended freedom. Freedom, of course, gets defended in many different ways. There's a distinction in philosophy between freedom in the political sphere, freedom from, for example, restraint by government, freedom from restraint by other people, say the majority, and freedom in a more personal way, or sometimes freedom in a more metaphysical sense. There is a so-called free will problem that philosophers are well concerned with. There's a sense in which neither of these is the kind of freedom that the existentialists are primarily concerned with. As for political freedom, well, certainly Sartre in particular comes out as a vigorous defender of freedom. But it's really parasitic on a much more basic notion of freedom that lies at the heart of his philosophy. And as for metaphysical freedom, whether there really is freedom, free will, in the very nature of things. This is a question that none of these philosophers address directly, except in the negative. Nietzsche, for example, makes fun of it and says that the very idea of a free will, the very idea of a subject who is detached from the causal nature of the universe, is really just a kind of illusion. The kind of freedom that they do talk about and the kind of freedom which is, I think, absolutely essential for understanding what we're going to be doing 
is that sense of personal freedom, which is neither political nor metaphysical, but has very much to do with how we think of ourselves, how we behave, how we think about our behavior. Kierkegaard has a nice little aphorism that sums up a good deal of this. He says, with reference to the uh, semi-revolution in Denmark in 1848, he says, people hardly ever make use of the freedoms that they do have, like freedom of thought. Instead, they demand freedom of speech as compensation. The idea is that freedom has to do with making choices. It has to do with deciding how you're going to live your life. Freedom also has to do with taking consequences. Once you've made your choice, you can't just say, I didn't anticipate that, I don't take responsibility for that. Having chosen, you're then responsible for what follows as well. Freedom is often connected with reason. Um, in much of the history of philosophy, to be free is to act rationally. What we find in the existentialist is a very different kind of thesis. In the ancient Greeks, it was often said that acting in accordance with reason makes us free. Acting according to the passions makes us a slave. The Enlightenment philosopher David Hume, who will pop up every once in a while in these lectures, had a very interesting reversal of this ancient wisdom. It was the ancient poet storyteller Aesop who once said that the passions should be the slave of reason. Hume, in the 18th century, said instead, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. He was one of the eccentrics in the history of philosophy I talked about. There are quite a few who did want to say something like, the passions are not really the monsters that they have often been portrayed to be. It's rather that passion motivates us. Without passion, there's no motivation. It's passions that give the meaning to life. Without passions, life is meaningless. So instead of talking about freedom and reason as necessarily conjoined, and passions as equivalent to a kind of slavery, what the existentialists suggest is that we think of our lives in terms of passion. This doesn't mean stupid passion, although that certainly has its place. But Kierkegaard, for example, when he talks about passionate commitment, is onto something I think very important. And basically it's that passions give life meaning, and it's through passionate commitment that we give our lives the particular meaning that it has. Another thesis that we find is based on that notion of existence that I very quickly mentioned. And I said that it is really the base of the word existentialism. And there's a sense in which all the philosophers will talk about put a very heavy premium on it. It starts with a distinction. And it's a distinction which, of course, some people will find offensive. It's the distinction between really existing, or what I think we would call living your life to the fullest, and just what Kierkegaard calls so-called existence, sort of just getting through, getting by, going along with the crowd, doing what you're supposed to do, being what is very blandly called a good person. For Kierkegaard, again, existence consists of passionate commitment. Nietzsche, who doesn't use the term much, nevertheless has a very clear idea about the same concept. For Nietzsche, to be truly existing, to really be a person, has to do with taking hold of your own life, realizing what your particular talents and virtues are, falling in love with yourself in a very important way, and understanding that what your life is about is manifesting those virtues, manifesting those talents, passionately self throwing yourself into the work you do. And as he puts it, again borrowing from the ancient Greeks, becoming the person that you really are. There's also a thesis of contingency. And this is something that I think most of you have probably thought about at one time or another. It's the idea that our lives are, in a way, happenstance. They could be very different. 
And we can play games. We do this all the time. If I lived in the Middle Ages, what would my life be like? And of course, any philosopher will quickly jump in and say, if you lived in the Middle Ages, of course, you wouldn't be you because you would be so different, your culture would be so different, your language would be so different, your very physical being would be so different that it doesn't make any sense to make the comparison. But we do this all the time. Um, you're driving down the street and you have a very close call in your automobile. And you say, if I had just arrived one minute earlier or 10 seconds later, there would have been a horrible accident. So too, you might ask the question, what if I had been born five minutes earlier? Would I still be the same person? Or would suddenly the contingencies of the universe be such that I would be someone quite different? This kind of question is very important. Martin Heidegger has a rather dramatic notion, which he calls thrownness. And the image is that we each get thrown into the world. We don't choose the century that we're born. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose the language we first learned to speak. We don't choose our early friends. And in fact, if you look at a good deal of your life, you realize that it's not something you choose, but something you're thrown into. All of this is going to have to be weighed against this notion of existence, the idea of passionate commitment, the idea of personal choice. And what we'll find in all the existentialists is a very delicate balance or I think better you might say, a dialectic, a kind of active tension between on the one hand this sense of contingency and you are what you are because of things that you had no control over, and on the other hand, you are what you are or you become what you become because of your personal commitments and choices. And that theme is going to run all the way through. Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, is often misunderstood. He talks about something he calls absolute freedom. And people often think, that means you can do anything you want to do, regardless of circumstances. Well, let me begin the lectures by saying, this is nonsense. And it's only people who have an axe to grind, perhaps against the French, who say such things. The truth is that Sartre is very well aware of the fact that people are born, in his generation, into a world that's filled with war and filled with ethnic violence. And the real question is, having been born into such a world, what do you do with it? That notion of contingency is perhaps best exemplified by one of the literary authors we'll talk about briefly. And that's Franz Kafka. He has a wonderful short story called Metamorphosis, which begins with a rather startling sentence that Gregor Samsa, the hero, wakes up and finds himself turned into a giant insect. Uh, sort of standard interpretation, think cockroach, since it's about the most noxious insect we can think of. Samps is born and finds himself a cockroach. In fact, before that, he was a very bourgeois, I think we could say little man. He had his job, he had his family, he dutifully went to the job every day, he dutifully supported his family, and suddenly he wakes up and he's completely different. It's a horror story. I've never seen it adequately filmed. I don't know how you would film such a story. But reading it, what makes it so horrible is the fact that, Kafka, that Gregor Samsa does not wake up thinking like an insect, whatever that would be. He wakes up thinking like a clerk and a family member and is somehow trying to cope with the impossibility of his new body. There's a sense in which existentialism takes us through such metamorphoses all the time, at least in the thought experiments that it presents to us. And the idea is that we find ourselves sometimes in very strange, even absurd situations, and in those absurd, strange situations, we have to figure out who we are and what we're supposed to do. There's a sense in which you might trace existentialism back to one of the keynotes of modern philosophy, and that is the French philosopher René Descartes, who said rather famously, I think, therefore I am.
Descartes said this as part of a rather lengthy argument, and this was, in fact, a premise that he was to use to prove all sorts of things, but that's not of interest for us here right now. What's important is that the very statement, I think, therefore I am, is sort of an emblem of a certain kind of philosophy. First of all, notice that the emphasis is on thought. And as I've been stressing, for the existentialist, your existence is not so much bound up with your thinking. In fact, Nietzsche, for example, will say, you never exist quite so much as when you're not thinking. But also, that idea of I am, and I am as a thinking thing, is something that is going to be challenged. For the existentialist, to exist is very much to be a being in the world, to be active, to be engaged. And the very idea that I think, therefore I am, somehow summarizes our self-identity, is to make it sound much simpler than it is. We don't find out who we are just by reflecting on ourselves and say, aha, here I am. But rather, you find out who you are, among other things, by looking to see what you've done, by looking to see how other people think of you, by looking to see how, in fact, you think of yourself in concrete terms. Because what existentialism is really all about is how we live our lives. The reason why I'm so attached to it is because it seems to me, of all philosophies, it is the one that is most geared to our very real concerns, our very real passions, our very real decisions. And if it's complained that existentialists don't really give us enough advice about precisely what we should do, they really just say things like, take responsibility for your actions, then I think one may conceive of that not so much as a weakness, but as a, rather as the great strength, and in fact, very central to the idea of existentialism itself. You don't tell people what they should do. What's central to all these figures is what you should do, how do you live, it's up to you. It's up to you to make the choice. It's up to you to gear up the passions, to commit yourself to the choice. And in someone like Nietzsche, it's up to you to discover in yourself who it is you really are, what your real talents and abilities are, the sorts of things that you love, and then commit yourself to those. Existentialism originated, as you can tell, from these five figures. Kierkegaard's Danish. Nietzsche and Heidegger are German. Camus and Sartre are French, or in this case, French-Algerian. But I would argue that existentialism really has its greatest impact and its greatest power in contemporary America. The fact is that we've always been a society which has prided itself on our sense of responsibility. But I think we've all noticed with a certain amount of despair that in the recent decades, it's all shifted into a kind of sensibility of victimization, a sense that the world is moving too fast for us, a sense that, for example, in politics, we don't make a difference, a sense that religion has gotten somehow superficial, a mere facade, a kind of sham. And we're looking for something deeper. We're looking for something that we can call our own. We're looking for a sense of empowerment to use greatly overused contemporary word. The truth is, I think, existentialism can give us that. Because what existentialism talks about and constantly hammers away is the idea that we are responsible, we do have choices, no matter how complicated or fast-moving the world is, and no matter how superficial those around us might be, we are in charge of our lives. We have to make the choices. We have to understand exactly how dark life can be and figure out what to do with that, as well as figure out where joy lies and pursue that too. So in the lectures that follow, I'm going to be running through these various figures, starting with Camus. And I'd like to give you basically two dozen different kinds of illustrations about how these theses play out in practice. Thanks. <laughs>